Item number, SCP-450, Object Class, Euclid, Special Containment Procedures. SCP-450 is to be kept locked and secured at all times, except for monthly maintenance and cleaning as detailed below. Any civilians or personnel who enter SCP-450 at any other time are to be considered lost, and no rescue attempts are to be made. Description. SCP-450 is the death row block of the abandoned Federal Penitentiary in Distance from entrance to the execution chamber is approximately 166.5 meters. A complex pattern, drawn in human blood, is located on the wall behind the electric chair. This pattern slowly degrades over time due to normal environmental decay and must be maintained regularly. The cell block is inhabited by what appears to be one or more hostile spectral entities. Attracting the attention of said entities is invariably fatal, and may or may not occur due to one of the following criteria. Entering the cell block by any means other than the main door. Moving at a speed greater than 0.25 meters per second. Staying in the cell block for more than 25 minutes at a time. Entering the cell block more than once every 24 hours. Operating any electronic device. Any sound louder than CA-25 decibels. Personnel assigned to maintain the containment pattern are instructed to silently walk down the center of the main hallway at a slow but steady pace. As it takes approximately 11 minutes to walk to the execution chamber at maximum safe rate of travel, personnel will have only 3 minutes to work on the pattern and still have enough time to reasonably guarantee a safe exit from the facility. Auditory and visual hallucinations including spectral voices, bleeding walls, and poltergeist activity are considered normal. Lack of same is cause for concern. Personnel are encouraged not to investigate any dead bodies, supernatural activity, or rotting remains. Item Number SCP-455 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Object SCP-455 cannot be moved nor contained in any structure. Containment must be made on site. No exploration or testing is to be made on or in SCP-455. No personnel are to remain in close proximity for more than five minutes. All physical contact with SCP-455 is forbidden. Any personnel breaking this order are to be quarantined. Any hallucinations experienced near SCP-455 are to be recorded and logged. Any personnel experiencing hallucinations are to be transferred. Any personnel attempting to enter SCP-455 are to be restrained by any means deemed necessary. Description: SCP-455 is a large cargo ship, currently run aground on the southern coast of Chile. Most of its structure is underwater and badly damaged with rust coating 85-90% to 90 of all surfaces. Internal structure appears to be significantly larger than external dimensions, and is not flooded despite large holes visible on outer hull. Internal structure appears to be a random assembly of rooms, halls, and structures. Initial salvage teams reported rooms made of human teeth, an engine with tendon strips for timing belts, a hall extending for 182.88 meters, or 600 feet, beyond where the outer hull should terminate, an open gym room with steel walls as pliant as taffy, and numerous audio and visual hallucinations. Team was lost after reporting entry to Central Navigation. Rescue team lost after reporting the investigation of screaming in a cargo section. Dr. has suggested the use of robots to map the interior of SCP-455 after the failure of several manned exploration teams. Experiment Log 455 details the attempts to explore SCP-455 and information established despite their failures overall. Explorative Logs of SCP-455 First Encounter Initial reports of disappearance of a salvage operation regarding SCP-455 led to its classification in our databases. 
A research team of five members was dispatched to confirm status of civilian researchers. This team consisted of two field analysts and three security personnel. Due to the low threat level initially given to a beached cargo vessel, no direct contact was kept with this team. Team orders required one contact to their control HQ every 24 hours. After three days of uneventful activity, team failed to report in, and after two days of lost contact, a secondary team was dispatched to investigate lapse in communications. This team consisted of 10 standard field agents with standard gear for confrontation with humanoid aggressors. A search of the vicinity of SCP-455 discovered encampment of the first research team in a condition that suggested an anticipated return. A rice cooker left running for several days contained heavily burnt food. Research laptops were left on and running, powered by the camp's portable generator. An analysis of the reports on the laptop indicated minimal activity of note from the site or from SCP-455 up until the date of ceased communications. The last entry mentions recording of human voices coming from deep within SCP-455 and a departure of the team to investigate for possible missed survivors from the salvage operation. After reporting in the state of Team 1's camp, Team 2 was ordered to maintain constant radio contact through the remote system already on camp. What follows is an abbreviated transcript of the audio recorded during Team 2's investigation of SCP-455 in search of Team 1. HQ, this is T2L. Please respond. T2L, this is HQ. We have you loud and clear, over. Understood, HQ. We are above deck on the vessel now. Sun is still up. We can see into the hold, but not very far. Flashlights also aren't helping matters much. We're foregoing direct descent into the hull and are going to use the stairs to the crew decks and access it from there so we're not separated. Is this acceptable, HQ? Over. Roger, T2L. You have complete discretion from here forward. Over. We've been out of contact with Team 1 for a couple days now already. A few more minutes won't hurt them. Proceed swiftly, but cautiously. Inconsequential audio deleted. HQ, this is T2L. We've got an anomaly here. Over. T2L, this is HQ. What's the situation? We're on deck three so far of the vessel, sir, but it has taken us, like, half an hour to get down this far. Something not quite right about the distance between floors for us to spend ten minutes getting between each. Understood, T2L. We suggest you send one member back up to the surface and then have him return. Please update us to the elapsed time. Over. Inconsequential audio deleted. T2L here, HQ. We sent up a man as advised, and he returned in four minutes. Sent him back twice in a sprint. Two minutes. We all recorded 30 to get down this far, at least. And we all recorded our scouts' return times as well. There is definitely something inconsistent. Proceed as planned, T2L. Time lapses have been recorded, but we see no need to abort mission over this. Please use precautions when these lapses occur and immediately try to raise us should you suspect one so we can confirm time since last contact. In addition, if radio silence is encountered, use utmost discretion. T2L respond. T2L. F**k. Inconsequential audio deleted. HQ, this is T2L. Please repeat. T2L, where the flying fist f**k have you been? Um, we, we were just talking, sir. How long ago? S sir th 30 seconds? Maybe 50? Guys? Yeah, less than a minute. T2L, please be advised. We've been out of contact with you for 16 hours, give or take. Over. S sir that can't be right. You were just... Listen, I don't know what the shit is going on out there, but this is what I want you to do. Get to the bottom of those f***ing stairs. Search the hold. Report back as soon as you get there, and then get the fuck out. Do I make myself clear? Sir, yes sir. Out. Inconsequential audio deleted. Sir, we're apparently at the bottom of the ship now. Five floors down by our count. Standard for a cargo vessel this size. We're approaching the hold now, and... T2L, this is HQ. And? Something is odd about the door, sir. Details, T2L. Define odd. Well, it's pristine, sir. 
The rest of the ship is something of a hole, but this door looks like it just came out of the metal press. Noted, T2L. Proceed through using maximum caution. Weapons ready. Sir, yes sir. Proceeding to open the door. Background lock system can be heard disengaging. We're looking into the hold now, sir, and moving forward. Remaining silent for now, T2L. Focus on searching the hold and getting topside. Background sound of door slamming closed and lock system rotating back into place. The f***? Did you close that? No, sir. It did it on its own. What the hell? We appear to be locked in now, HQ, but we can see daylight above us, so we can probably rappel out if the door won't. What is that? HQ, there appear to be people down here with us. Estimated 15 or so people in the corner huddled together. They look injured. We're approaching. Hey, that's Don. Don! Man! Wake up! Wake- Oh. Oh, f***. HQ, come in. HQ, come in. Come in! T2L, this is HQ. What is it? We found the salvage team in the first team. They're here, and I don't know if they're alive or not, but they're... T2L. They're what, T2L? Come in! Wait, where did Ramses go? He was right... Daniel! Vincent! What the f***? HQ, come in. We just lost three... No, four. Four members. T2L makes sense. What do you mean, lost? I hear no weapons fire. They're just... gone, sir. They were standing behind us at flank and they're just... gone! Spencer? What's... Someone shine a light on Spencer. Where'd he go? Son of a bitch. T2L, what's going on in there? HQ, we've lost four men, apparently. They were just at the rear of us and now they're gone. Unknown sound similar to sliding metal. T2L. T2L, respond. Respond. Where the hell did he go now? HQ. Come in, HQ. T2L, we're here. Please respond. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, they responded. Guys, HQ responded. HQ, this is Baker, and I'm here with Jensen and Thomas from Team 2 sent to- We know who you're with, Baker. We were just talking to T2L about 10 seconds ago. Where is- H- HQ, we haven't heard from you in two weeks. We're out of rations, though we found some food in one of the crew rooms. T2L has been dead since we were in the hold. He- He went to investigate the people in the hold, and as soon as he approached them, that hatch in the back, it flew open, made a huge noise. We all turned to look at it, then back to T2L and he was gone. Him and those people in the corner, just gone, like the others. We searched the ship, up and down, up and down, but never found him. Did you return to the surface for supplies, Baker? That ship should only be five floors at most. We, we never thought to do that. This ship is at least 30 floors HQ, at least. But we found a crew quarters with food and we've been... Baker, our first team reported that ship had been ashore for at least 30 years. Maybe more. What exact food did you find there that was edible? Baker, 30 years. Baker, listen closely. I want you and whoever is left to get topside immediately. We are dispatching a rescue team to... Baker! Baker! Come in! What the fuck is going on over there? A third team of heavily armed recon units was dispatched to the SCP-455 site and investigated the cargo hold from above deck using high-powered flashlights and flares. No trace of any life was in the hold, nor was there any trace there had ever been life there. Reports indicate a layer of dust and rust approximated to be an inch thick as determined by the cloud and dispersal caused by dropping up flares into the hold. Team 3 was recalled and a high-priority research team deployed to SCP-455 for deeper investigation as to the fate of all three missing groups. Team 3 After the failure of the first two teams dispatched to SCP-455, a third team was put together and sent. This team was composed of more veteran members with far more experience exploring and investigating sites of interest or risk. This team was composed of five persons and included an additional technician who would remain outside SCP-455 at all times to maintain communications linked to the team. Unknown to Team 3, a fourth team coded as Ripcord composed of five members as well 
was put on standby on site, approximately 10 miles away. Their purpose was emergency evac of Team 3 should it become necessary, and they were to proceed to SCP-455 site immediately after Team 3 entered it, to reduce response time. Team 3's issued gear included two separate video recording units, one issued to the leader, T3L, and one to a video specialist, T3V. This was deemed necessary due to the lapses in time experienced during Team 2's investigation. One member of Team 3 was instructed to enter SCP-455 through the cargo loading area directly and would be tethered to land by a pulley system. HQ T3L, this is HQ. We are online and receiving feeds. Over. T3L Roger HQ, this is T3L. We are preparing to enter the ship via the stairs. Evans is in position at the cargo hold. HQ. Understood. Proceed through both entrances and move directly to the cargo hold to rendezvous with Evans. T3V is recording his descent, and all floodlights are active within the hold, as well as the ones on the deck. Team 3's primary force proceeded down the stairs into SCP-455, while its secondary unit descended into the cargo hold where Team 2 disappeared. Within three minutes of descending into SCP-455, the primary force's video feed ended. The secondary force experienced no issues at all, and waited in the cargo hold under the observation of T3V, who recorded what consisted of five minutes of Evans walking in circles, dancing a brief jig, and waving up at the camera. HQ considered sending T3V to investigate the stairs, but it was decided that full attention should be paid to Evans, who was within SCP-455 and experiencing no anomalous activity. During mounting concern on whether to abort or proceed with the mission, T3L's video feed returned. HQ. T3L respond immediately, over. We lost feed to you. What happened? T3L. HQ! HQ, come in! For God! You're there! Oh, God. Th this is T3L. We've lost two men. Somehow the rest of us are still alive. This place, it's... it's... HQ. T3L, how much time has passed for your unit? T3L. T time? Uh, ten hours, sir. We came down here ten hours ago and... HQ. Now slow down, T3L. Are you in a safe location at this current moment? T3L. Yes, we... We're fine in this room. Seems to be food storage. HQ. Touch nothing in that room, T3L. And listen closely to me. The mission has been in progress for five minutes. Evans is in the hold, apparently doing the hammer now. Now listen, I want you to detail to me exactly what has happened, and do not leave that room. Do not eat anything in that room. Take a breath, secure the entryway, and talk to me. T3L explained that they had proceeded down 20 floors within the ship when divers have established that it can't possibly have more than 6 from the exterior. During this time, T3V was instructed to raise Evans back out of the cargo area and secure him topside. T3L Okay, okay. Relax, relax. Okay. HQ Okay. We proceeded down the stairs as normal. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until we noticed we had gone down far more flights than it should have taken to get to the bottom to enter the cargo area. We sent Eric up to retrace our steps and he was only able to go up two floors. We had descended at my count at least fifteen. There was no hatch back to the surface. The stairs just went up to the ceiling and ended. We could hear his every word from his location. Eric then said the hatch to that floor was open and he saw someone in it leaning against a wall. They were well within earshot of us as well, but hadn't reacted to any of our conversation. HQ. Keep going, T3L. T3L. So, Eric. He goes through the hatch to try and figure out who this person is. They hadn't moved, hadn't shown any hostility, and according to him, they weren't even looking our direction, like we didn't exist to them. Suddenly, we heard gunfire, so the entire team rushed up two flights, and just like he said, the stairs just stopped at the ceiling, and the floor hatch was open. Nobody was in that hallway, not a soul. No Eric, no second person, no bullet shells, nothing but the walls. HQ, the walls. 
T3L. The walls were wrong, hazy, like you were viewing them through a gas leak. They were flowing and fluid, just wrong. I closed the hatch. I, I don't know why I didn't go in and look for Eric, but I just, I felt like I couldn't. I wrote him off as lost immediately. I wasn't going in there, or sending any of my men in there after him. HQ. Understood T3L. Keep going. T3L. So, the rest of the squad. We go back down the stairs, can't go up, not going in that hallway. All the rest of the floors were closed off. We went down maybe ten more flights. Then the stairs started changing. They were solid metal, like aluminum. But now there were holes in the steps, and the metal looked rusted in some places. Old. Like the rest of the ship. Up until now, everything had seemed rather clean. It didn't dawn on me immediately that the clean parts were actually stranger than the old parts. T3L. We found a food storage area down here. Everything seems in good shape, but we didn't touch any of it yet. I read the Team 2 logs. I sent a man out into the hall to see what we could do on this floor. There seems to be a series of ladders in a group at the far end, but the entirety of this floor is food storage. It actually doesn't make any sense why there are so many of these rooms. I'm talking over 20 on this one floor, and they're all big enough for 10 people to stand inside and have room to move. Some of them are locked, probably for the best. HQ and the ladders. T3L. We haven't gone down them yet. Wanted to see if we could get someone from the outside first. HQ. Down. They go down. What the flaming shit is going? Okay. Sweet dapper Jesus of the Gentleman's Club. Look, I don't want to put any of you at risk, but we need to find you a way out of there. If you can't go back up, and you can only go down, only send one man. T3V and Evans are topside and perfectly fine. We're sending a diving crew around the ship exterior to see if we can pinpoint your location inside it using thermal. T3L. Understood, sir. Contact with T3L was lost after this transmission and remained disconnected for 12 hours. Divers around SCP-455 could not effectively scan the ship wreckage through thermal, as the ship exhibited temperatures far higher than the water surrounding it. At sunrise, T3V and Evans were ordered to return to SCP-455 and reinvestigate the ship through the cargo hold. Upon activation of the cargo lights, all missing members of Team 3 were found within the cargo hold, in an apparently catatonic state. Only the member Eric who went missing per the Team 3 recordings was unaccounted for. All remaining members remained in a state of stasis until removed from the ship, and left undisturbed for approximately an hour. All recall moving down the mentioned ladders in the last transmission, but nothing after that point that would lead them to being in the cargo hold. Team 3 exploration ended, and robotic exploration is now a viable option. Exploration Log Record 455-3 Record of last major exploration attempt by MTF Zeta-9. Exploration team personnel consists of three MTF Zeta-9 members, Mr. A, Mr. R, and Miss S, two agents, Mr. G and Sir K, and one Class D subject, D-11. Team is equipped with basic foundation equipment package for semi-aquatic hostile environment exploration. In addition to the Mark V Heavy Recon Nautilus class suits issued to Zeta-9 team members, two mobile recon vehicles, commonly called MARVs, are also issued. Mission time begins at 0800 hours on MARV-1 malfunctions during initial transfer of team from observation platform to SCP-455 and is recalled. MARV-2 continues normal operation and remains in the water as the team climbs to the deck of SCP-455. Gee, holy hell. How is this heap even staying afloat? A. It's not floating, it's grounded out. This is just the part that sticks up. G. Is it even safe to walk on? What if it gives way? S. Oh, relax, big boy. You've been on deck for over 30 seconds, you already beat the last team's time. Radio silence for 10 seconds. Team proceeds to the cabin area near the center section of SCP-455, with MARV-2 following at sea level. D-11. Oh no. Hell no. Not a chance. 
You can shoot my happy ass, but I am not going down there. K. It's not a request. Walk or be strapped to the Marv and floated. Your choice. D11. What a bullshit way to make parole. A. Okay, kiddos. Masks on. Rats. Canned air from here on out. R. Is your seal still good? Let me check. Good. G. Get those tanks on D11. Team proceeds down the main stairwell of the cabin area. Area below is mostly flooded. Marv 2 joins team via a large puncture below the waterline. A. Nothing weird yet. We have a small chamber with halls off to the left and right. Marv 2 appears to be working fine. Hi guys. S. I say left. Left keeps us in the ship proper. Right seems to be snaking off outside physical dimensions. K. We go right. We are under advisement to explore the extra-dimensional segments for possible details. S. No. We go left. Right will take us down the rabbit hole of screwed much, much too fast. K. This is not a discussion. S. Listen, asshole. I... D11. The f*** is... A. S. Let it go. It's not... K. I will. D11. Touching my foo. R. Guys. Sudden burst of radio static, along with several inarticulate voices, and the sound of grinding metal, continues for eight seconds. A. Jesus. S. Did we just... Rock? G. A. Is there any record of movement in 455? A. Not one. Guys, can you still see us? Any movement from 455? Base team reports zero movement of any kind from or around SCP-455. K. Where is the class D? Several seconds of radio silence. S. I had eyes on him the whole time. He was against this wall. What? A. What is... Oh. Are you kidding? R. Get your pick and get that out of the wall. R. Metal can't do that. It's like it rusted the tooth out right along with it. S. It's like it's been there for ages. Three seconds of radio silence. K. D11 is now missing. Presumed dead or unable to be retrieved. Proceeding down right hallway. Let's move. Team proceeds down hallway, followed by Marv 2. Video data shows hallway slightly tilted to the right, with 80% flooding. Team is equipped with wetsuits and air tanks. All equipment appears to be working normally. A. Shit. We have contact. K. Let me... O. Oh. Reporting. Water appears to end abruptly at the end of the hall. It appears some sort of force is keeping the water out of the next chamber. The division is very precise, and can be crossed without incident. It's like an invisible force. S. Christ. The room's so damn blue. It's really bright. It almost looks fresh. R. Dead end, too. Looks like we go left after all, but... G. The hallway's gone! A. The f to Shit. Visual contact with team is suddenly lost for two seconds. Once contact is resumed, Marv 2 shows a flooded cargo section of SCP-455. No trace of team is seen anywhere. Marv 2 is unresponsive to controls for 22 seconds. Marv 2 suddenly accelerates at a much higher velocity than it is capable of, impacting with a rusted wall. Video continues for four seconds after impact. Plant matter observed during the last two seconds of video matches no known species and appears exceptionally hostile. Base team is unable to send transmissions to exploration team. K. The, uh, entry hall is now gone. It appears the door now opens onto a shaft, with several ladders going down. The top of the shaft is in line with the top of the hatch door. There appears to be water leakage from several seams in the roof with... G. I can't see the bottom. I mean, at all. That thing goes down a mile. K. With some flaking rust falling as well. The Marv appears to have vanished as well. A. 
Okay. We go down and look for the nearest exit point or way up. If we don't find anything in half an hour, I want R and S to start excavation charges on a wall until something opens up. R. Roger the hell out of that. I'll start now if you like. A. Everyone down the hole. Watch your feet. If anything feels weak, skip to the next rung. I want safety lines on every... Several seconds of metallic screeching, along with two bass throbs. Contact is lost for four seconds. A. Down, 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 down! G. God, it's closing up, it's... S. Is my shepherd, I shall... A. Blow the floor for f**k's sake! R. Get up! 18 seconds of radio silence. K. It's in his bloody eye. It's in... A. Help him up. Just get him over there. S. Mary, full of grace, the... Four heavy bass throbs, followed by screeching. Sound appears to be comprised of many individuals, with many non-human animal and mechanical sounds being isolated. A. In weeks. I can't find them anymore. The way is too curved. I can't drag... Radio silence for eight seconds. K. The other day, upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. G. Laughter for several seconds. Oh, God. <laughs> Make it stop crying. Radio contact lost for 20 minutes. Mission called as failure at 0813 hours. Sporadic contact made over the next two weeks. Recorded as follows. A. My foot is evaporating. R. Help, help, help. R. Humming tunelessly. S. We there. It's just an illusion of a fish. It... Oh. Oh, Jesus, please... G. Laughter. K. 20 seconds of a single sustained scream. K. Yes, I ju... A. Home. I want my home. I don't want to feel the rust in me anymore. I... S. Soft crying. Barely audible. G. On it! I shot it! I shot... A. Re-up, maybe? We haven't tried up in a few days. S. I'll eat it, but not because... D-11. It's cold. No radio contact with team reported beyond this point. Radio monitoring is ongoing. Single report, one month after mission end, of Miss S observed waving from the deck. Report filed by single watchguard and not verified by any other sources. Item number SCP-472 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-472 is to be kept in the center of an empty locked cell, measuring 37 meters by 37 meters, or 122 by 122 feet. All personnel wishing to enter for research purposes must undergo a psychological evaluation and submit a research request before being permitted entry. Personnel should not remain within 18 meters or 60 feet of the stone for more than five minutes without being directly monitored by security personnel. Update 472-1 No personnel exposed to SCP-472 through Stage 6 of its effects may be allowed more than four consecutive minutes of further exposure without direct approval of Site Command. Update 472-2 Once every 60 days, one D-Class personnel must be exposed to SCP-472 for a period of between 10 and 27 minutes. Update 472-3 Due to biomass loss, no personnel may be exposed to SCP-472 more than once in a 48-hour period without explicit approval by Dr. A. Jones. Description SCP-472 is a red garnet of the pyrope spessartite variety of unusual size, 1.8 carat. The phrase, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart, has been engraved in 2 millimeters, 0.08 inches, high lettering on the stone's surface. Relevance of the phrase is unknown. 
When any organism possessing a heartbeat passes within an 18 meter or 60 foot radius of SCP-472, that subject will begin to hear the distant beating of a heart within their head. The heartbeat heard directly corresponds with the subject's own heartbeat, with the frequency of the palpitations increasing or decreasing with the pulse of the subject. Prolonged exposure causes a variety of additional psychological effects. Stage 1 Onset 5 to 7 minutes. Low level feelings of unease and anxiety. Effects cease immediately on vacating area. Stage 2. Onset 6 to 21 minutes. Gradually increasing feelings of anxiety and paranoia. Effects decrease on vacating area and cease within 5 minutes. Stage 3. Onset 18 to 27 minutes. High-level feelings of anxiety and paranoia. Subject begins to hallucinate, reporting seeing the world around them tinged with red and hearing vague whispering noises. 27% of subjects also report strong feelings of guilt. Effects decrease within 20 minutes of vacating area and cease within 60 minutes. Stage 4 Onset 34 to 59 minutes Previous symptoms increase. Hallucinations become more vivid and visual. Frequent hallucinations include rivulets of blood trailing down the walls, images of dead bodies, thumping, screaming, and ambulatory corpse-like figures. 65% of subjects rendered mentally incapable of leaving the influence of SCP-472. Effects decrease within 60 minutes of vacating area and cease within 3 hours. Stage 5 Onset 55 to 69 minutes Previous symptoms increase 100% of subjects rendered mentally incapable of leaving the influence of SCP-472 38% of subjects exposed enter a state of catatonia This state has a 76% fatality rate if subjects are not removed from SCP-472's area of influence Effects decrease within 6 hours of vacating area and cease within 24 hours. Stage 6 Onset 361 to 723 plus minutes Surviving subjects now capable of leaving the influence of SCP-472, though many do not realize this unless prompted. Previous symptoms vary in degree of intensity and become sporadic alternating with periods of lucidity indefinitely until subject leaves or is removed from the area. Effects cease within 24 hours of vacating area. SCP-472 was recovered from the mansion residence of a wealthy man living in Foundation investigators were alerted by local reports of hauntings by domestic staff after was hospitalized by a fall. Mobile Task Force Delta-5, front runners, was assigned to investigate due to possible connection to ongoing projects. Investigation narrowed down the origin of the anomalous effects to SCP-472, which had been prominently displayed in its jewel collection. Origin of SCP-472 is under investigation. SCP-472 was located via reports from the so-called anomalous community, from interfacing with Mobile Task Force Sigma-3, bibliographers. Initial theories from anomalous community sources categorized SCP-472 as a seal, containing an entity responsible for SCP-472's anomalous effects. However, further analysis has not supported this, rather indicating that SCP-472's appearance as a red garnet may be due to a fundamental perception error of unknown nature. Sources have not been able to confirm anything substantial about the origin or nature of SCP-472. Addendum 47245 Effects of subsequent exposure Subjects previously exposed to SCP-472's effects experience a cumulative 10-20% increase in the speed of onset of certain SCP-472 effects with each additional exposure. Eventually, subjects will immediately begin experiencing symptoms at Stage 2 levels, with Stage 3 occurring within 5-10 to 10 minutes. Stages 4 to 5 then occur as normal. Time of onset of stage 6 is not affected and continues to occur no earlier than 361 minutes after initial exposure. 
Hallucinations begin to differ in nature when a subject is exposed to SCP-472 more than one to five times. Subjects report visions of a massive growing collection of skinless, organic material resembling animal and human organs, muscular structures, bones, though no recognizable bones, etc., joined together in a fashion that does not occur in nature. All subjects report multiple hearts beating within the biomass, sometimes dotting its surface. After the fifth exposure, all subjects report seeing this, whether or not previous hallucinations remain present or superimposed. Additionally, interviews with multiple exposure subjects data expunged, anomalous information element. See Interview 472-0165-B. Interview Log 472-0165-B Interviewed Janice Erickson Interviewer Pending unrelated evaluation Referred to as interviewer throughout log Forward Interview held after recovery of SCP-472 Subject was part of household staff at the residence from which SCP-472 was recovered Subject aware of SCP-472's existence and effects but had to be informed that SCP-472 was specifically a garnet stone formerly located in <laughs> jewelry collection. Begin Log Interviewer Tell us how you first became aware of the stone's properties. Janice Erickson The stone? Or what the stone does? Interviewer The stone's properties. What it does? Janice Erickson Well, I... All right. I'd always heard stories from people about how Manor was haunted, but, you know, I never believed in ghosts or haunting or any of that tripe. I still don't, I guess. I don't really know what to... Never mind. I wouldn't have taken the haunting stuff seriously anyway. Big old mansion with an old rich white dude who lives alone. Of course people are going to say it's haunted. People think everything's haunted. Subject pauses. Requests glass of water. Request approved. Janice Erickson. Anyway, I was right. The house was never haunted. It was just that room. Or I guess the stone. Interviewer. How did you first enter R***'s employment? Janice Erickson. One of my friends told me about the job posting. Mr. R*** is kind of creepy, okay? But he paid... The job offer was like three times what you can get anywhere else. My friend Elizabeth got hired with me. My sister Maddie was supposed to apply too, but she had a friend who was one of Mr. B***'s old staff before he went and fired everyone the time before, and they warned her not to go. She tried to talk me out of it, but I'm a single mom, okay? You don't pass that kind of thing up. Interviewer You said Mr. B***** has previously fired all members of his household staff. Janice Erickson Oh yeah, he did. I guess he did that every few months just fired most of the new people. He only kept a couple people for longer than that, before me, but the last one of them died a few months after I was hired. Carla, her name was. Interviewer, what do you know about the cause of Carla's death? Subject pauses. Janice Erickson, I don't know. She was old. Maybe it had nothing to do with the, um, haunting. I don't know. Maybe she was just old. Anyway, Mr. hired me right away. I think he liked me. All the rest of the staff were new too, except for Carla. Interviewer. When did you first encounter the stone's effect? Janice Erickson. I didn't for a while. We were all assigned to clean different parts of the house. Carla wouldn't let us talk to each other in the house. Said Mr. didn't like it. But, you know, some of us talked outside of the house. They mentioned a creepy feeling about the third floor atrium. The atrium was where Mr. kept all his best things on display. There were hundreds of things in that room, you know? All these jewels and display cases and swords hanging on the walls. The whole room was kind of creepy, though. It had these big glazed windows and this big glass roof that Mr. kept totally covered up by black cloth. And there weren't many lights in there. You know, shadows everywhere. There was just no reason that room had to be so creepy. I think he made it that way because he was kind of a dick, actually. Never actually treated us like real people. I don't know. I'm sorry. What were we talking about? 
Interviewer. Your first exposure to the stone's effect. Janice Erickson. Oh, right. It was a month or two after I started working. Carla made me go find Marjorie, who'd been assigned to clean the atrium that week. As soon as I got into the room, I heard this sound in my head. Like, thump thump, thump thump. I couldn't tell if it was far away or coming from inside my head. I was pretty creeped out by that, but what was I gonna do? I told myself I was imagining it and went through the atrium to find Marjorie. I call for her, and she doesn't respond. The lights were all low, like I said, and the room was like a maze with all the display cases and old things with curtains over them. Finally, I find her slumped over in back of one of the display cases. She looks at me, but it's like she doesn't really see me. She keeps muttering something about blood on the walls, but I look around and everything seems normal. Creepy, but normal. I'm still hearing the thump thump noise, and it's going faster, and I realize it's my own heart. Subject pauses for breath and takes a drink of water. Interviewer, continue, please. Janice Erickson. I dragged Marjorie out of there as fast as I could, and I felt fine after. I even felt a little silly. Marjorie got better after a while, said she just had a bad day and she was sorry and it wouldn't happen again. She was never a friend of mine, so I didn't ask her any questions about it. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. After that, she took a week off from work. When she came back, she didn't want to go back to the atrium. Said it was a bad memory. Carla made her go back. Mr. W's orders, apparently. After like 30 minutes or so, we hear her just screaming. Like she was being murdered. She came rushing down the stairs, babbling about seeing dead bodies, and they were looking at her. And she could see more blood on the walls, and she wasn't imagining it this time. Carla made her calm down and took her into a room and ordered us out. They spent a while in there. When they came out, Marjorie left without speaking to us. Carla told us she'd quit and was given severance pay. Later on, one of the other maids told us Marjorie was paid to keep her mouth shut and move away. Later on, we heard she killed herself. I don't know if that's true or not. Is it true? Do you know anything about that? Interviewer, I'm sorry. That is classified information. Please continue. Janice Erickson. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know who was cleaning the atrium after that. Maybe nobody. I didn't really get on much with the other maids. None of them seemed to like me. A couple were friends with Elizabeth, and she kept telling me things about the third floor atrium. Her friends said they'd heard from other people that the atrium was haunted because of everyone Mr. killed to get all those valuable things on display in there. There was this creepy looking tapestry in there with skulls on it, African I think, covered one of the windows. Elizabeth and her friends were convinced this was haunted by the ghosts of some dead slaves or something. Interviewer, where did they get that idea? Janice Erickson, I don't know, it was just something they heard. A month later, Elizabeth finally married her out of town fiance and moved away to After that, the other staff didn't talk to me. I never got assigned the atrium, but every so often I thought I heard the heartbeat when I got too close to that part of the third floor. Interviewer, you informed our agents that you'd had prolonged exposure to the stone yourself. How did that come about? Janice Erickson, well first off, I didn't know it was the stone. I thought it was the tapestry, or just the room. One day, Mr. went on one of his rampages. He did that now and then. Walked around the house yelling at all the maids and then going into empty rooms and yelling at no one. Then he fired everyone. Everyone except me, Carla, and some ridiculously young girl with big tits who worked in the kitchen. Interviewer, why do you believe he didn't fire you? Janice Erickson, I don't know. I wish I knew. Maybe it was because none of the other staff talked to me. Maybe just coincidence. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. I ended up taking on most of the other's duties. Then, Carla assigned me to clean the atrium. I wasn't happy about it, but I was now getting paid even more because I was doing so much more that I didn't want to get dismissed. So, I go into the atrium again. Subject pauses again. Takes another drink. Janice Erickson. And I heard my heart beating, of course. Again, I saw the tapestry with the skulls on it and I felt like they were watching me. 
I spent five minutes dusting in there and started freaking out. I thought maybe I'd end up like Marjorie, and I just ran out of the room. I felt better pretty quick, but I had to go in again, you know? Apparently, Carla hadn't been making anyone clean up in there since Marjorie left, so there was dust settled over everything. I didn't want to get fired, and I didn't want to quit, and I didn't want to make the stupid teenager in the kitchen's clean haunted room all by herself. So I had to go back. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. This happened a few times. I couldn't stay in there long without freaking out. Sometimes everything would turn red, and I'd feel like I was suffocating. I'd hear whispers everywhere, though I couldn't understand what they were saying. I kept thinking they were the ghosts, noticing I was there, telling each other someone was here. I remembered Marjorie talking about blood on the walls, and she'd only been in there half an hour. I couldn't stop looking at that goddamn skull tapestry. Eventually I figured, well, Mr. doesn't even come in this room anymore. He's so old and sick and, really, if the tapestry was haunted by dead slaves, I'd be doing him a favor. It wasn't even that big and couldn't be worth that much, you know? So, one night I... Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. You aren't going to tell him any of this, are you? Interviewer. That is extremely unlikely. Please continue. Janice Erickson. Like I said, I had no idea it was the stupid rock making all this happen. So I took the tapestry down. When I took it down, I saw blood on the walls behind it, and I really freaked out. I was just going to hide somewhere, but after seeing the blood, I took the goddamn thing out back and I burned it. It really stunk when it burned. When it was gone, I felt better. I stayed out of the atrium for a week, just in case. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. When I went in there again, of course, I felt the heartbeat again. I was pissed. I told myself I was imagining things, and I felt really guilty about burning the tapestry. Like, guiltier than you can imagine. Guiltier than I'd ever been since I was a kid and accidentally killed my pet goldfish. I spaced out in the room and just kept cleaning and crying. Subject pauses, attempting to compose self. Janice Erickson. Then, I heard far away screaming, and I stopped dusting and saw the blood trickling slowly down the walls. My eyes were all blurry with tears and I tried to wipe them away and my hand came back bloody. I saw bodies, naked, dead, rotting things, mostly half hidden behind display cases. There was this dead dog, and it was almost completely rotted and covered in maggots, but was still trying to move and looked so horrible I couldn't even scream. I tried to run, I really did, but I couldn't make my legs move. I kept trying to yell for help, but I couldn't. I was so sure I was going to die. This lasted hours. I think I passed out and woke up a couple times. After a while, I saw this corpse standing around, staring at the walls. Then out of nowhere, he was staring at me. I think that was as close as I got to screaming because I really tried then. He never got close to me, but he kept staring. He'd disappear and then reappear somewhere else in the room, staring at me again. I saw others too, but they were on the other side of the room doing, I don't know, something horrible probably. And the blood never stopped leaking from the walls. Sometimes I thought it was covered in it. Sometimes it disappeared, and then it would come back with new corpses. The thumping and screaming from far away never stopped. Subject pauses. Janice Erickson. After a long, long time, the corpses kind of faded and the room stopped seeming so red. It felt like being half woken up. I realized I could move my legs again and I got out of that room as fast as I could. I'd spent a little over 12 hours in there, alone. Interviewer. Did you return? Janice Erickson. No, I never did. The next day I went directly to Carla and told her I quit. But she immediately offered me double the high salary I was already being paid. Said Mr. liked me, liked how quiet I was, and probably wouldn't be hiring anyone new for the next few weeks. I tried to tell her about the room and she clammed up and said something about fumes and that she'd look into it. I went home and held my daughter for a long time. 
and thought about what kinds of jobs I could get somewhere else. But the money, it was just too good. I convinced myself that I must have inhaled something weird. Maybe some kind of delayed reaction from burning the tapestry. Or maybe that was the revenge from the tapestry for burning it. And everything would be fine now. So, I went back. I told Carla I'd take the offer if I didn't have to go in the atrium again. She wasn't really happy about it, but agreed. And you know what? Everything was fine for the next two and a half months. Interviewer. What happened after two and a half months? Janice Erickson. I was taking a nap on a couch on the second floor at the end of my shift before going home. I'd gotten... comfortable, I guess. I was having anxious dreams and woke up to hear whispering. Familiar whispering, just like I'd heard in the atrium the other nights. I couldn't believe what was happening. I thought maybe I was still dreaming. Then the walls started bleeding, and I couldn't walk again. That's when they... appeared. Subject pauses a long time. Interviewer, please continue. Who appeared? Subject appears to be fighting back tears. Janice Erickson, the corpse from before, staring at me. He was with my sister. She didn't look hurt, but there was something off about her. I was sure she was dead. And then they started talking to me. Interviewer, what did they say? Janice Erickson. They said I'd make it to the other side, that I only needed to take another step, and that I'd know everything. My sister kept repeating something. God looks on the heart. God looks on the heart. Then I felt like I was hallucinating or dreaming, and they kept disappearing, coming back, saying the same things. Then I kept seeing the corpse man from before, staring, and then laughing, saying, You don't mean anything. This doesn't mean anything. You are going to die, and nothing you are will matter. Then I saw him with Carla, and Carla looked half rotted. He was back to saying what he was saying before, how I only needed to take another step and I'd know everything, and trying to promise me something, but I couldn't make out what, over the thumping and screaming, which kept getting louder and louder. Carla didn't say anything, just looked at me with a blank face. She started mouthing something as the room got redder and redder. I'm bad at reading lips, but eventually I figured out what she was trying to say. It wants the foundation. Don't let them feed it. I don't. Interviewer. Wait. Repeat your last sentence. Janice Erickson. Carla was mouthing, It wants the foundation. Don't let them feed it. Interviewer. Do you know what she meant by that? Janice Erickson. I have no idea what any of them meant by any of that. Why? Interviewer. Disregard that. Proceed. Janice Erickson. Okay. Well, after that, I managed to make myself move, and I got the hell out of the house. By the time I got home, I felt okay, just really shaken. I called my sister and told her that I'd had a really bad dream. I really expected her to be dead, but she was perfectly fine, and she's still fine. But Carla, I found out that Carla was dead. They say she passed away in her sleep, in her quarters at Manor. So maybe that wasn't really my sister I saw, but it really was Carla? Maybe it killed her, or maybe she died and it took her soul, I guess, and then came after me. I just don't know. Mr. fell and ended up in the hospital the very next night. So, is that a coincidence? I don't know. Maybe he'll say something to you. He sure hasn't said anything to anyone else. And that's all, really. After that, you guys came along, so you know the rest better than me. Interviewer. Thank you for your time, Miss Erickson. End log. Closing statement. Subject administered amnestics and released. Addendum 472-78. Area of Influence Conditional Increase When no subjects have been exposed to SCP-472 for more than five minutes within a period of two months, its area of influence begins increasing by a rate of 0.5 meters, or 1.6 feet, per hour. Expansion is temporary, reverting back to the original 18 meters, or 60 feet, area of effect once a subject undergoes exposure. Addendum 472-130 Possible Physical Biomass Presence 
Further testing with subjects exposed multiple times to SCP-472. Data expunged, indicating that the Garnet Stone classified as SCP-472 may in fact be the only visible portion of a much larger and continually increasing biomass, existing in so-called transdimensional data expunged, metaphor of the tip of the iceberg. Object class pending review. Additional containment measures pending review. Addendum 472-135. Subject biomass alteration. Data expunged. Subsequent testing of subjects exposed to SCP-472 indicates that all subjects experienced a 0.01 to 1.35% decrease in biomass with each exposure to SCP-472. Subjects remain unaware of this event. Containment procedures updated. Item number SCP-473 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures A 5km area surrounding SCP-473 is off-limits to all personnel. Human testing in this range is prohibited without O5 approval. Above all, loss of human life within this 5km area must be prevented. A further 20 km distance is to be secured by no less than two Foundation combat units at all times. Any unauthorized vessels entering this area are to be sunk and their crew eliminated. Vessels approaching the site but remaining outside of the 20 km kill zone may be boarded and turned away with the use of Class A amnestics. Description SCP-473 is a wrecked Spanish galleon typical of those used in the early 16th century. It is resting on the ocean floor at coordinates expunged. SCP-473 was brought to the attention of the Foundation after the loss of a research vessel operated by University. A search and rescue team which approached SCP-473 reported audio anomalies like giggling and pleading for help. They reported voices in English, Spanish, and an unrecognized language. Agents embedded in immediately moved to cancel the search, declaring the crew and vessel lost. Note: Though the wreck is designated SCP-473, anomalies present may be due to cargo within the wreck. Further investigation of this is advised against at this time. Proximity Effects Phenomena encountered by ships approaching SCP-473 include disembodied voices, which may have knowledge of Foundation personnel and operations, and minor physical disturbances, such as unidentified vibrations and impacts on the ship. Electrical disturbances are common, causing primary and emergency lighting to fail. This results in absolute darkness within a ship, which combined with persuasive voices created by SCP-473, causes extreme disorientation. Personnel in the area are advised to confirm the physical presence of anyone they are in communication with, and to ignore any voices that have no discernible source. Periodic cries for help from the water, coming from the direction of SCP-473, are to be expected and ignored. Sharp objects and weapons are to be secured in locked containers while within 20 kilometers of SCP-473. Addendum 1 Interview SCP-473-B Interviewed J. Executive Officer of the Foundation Vessel which identified and sonographed SCP-473 Interviewer Dr. Halen, SCP-473 Project Lead Forward a Foundation destroyer sailed within 500 meters of SCP-473 before retreating to a distance of 3 kilometers and sinking. Evacuation of the ship was successful, excepting the captain, but 16 hands were lost during the three hours the crew awaited rescue. Below is an interview with the highest ranked surviving officer. Begin Log April 17th, 2000 Dr. Halen our destroyer sank minutes after locating SCP-473. Why don't you start by explaining how your ship was damaged? XO. Well, I know what happened, just not how. As we got closer to the site, these voices got louder. Below decks started reporting some hard knocking against the hull. 
It got rough as we got close. The ship started to vibrate a bit, and some of the electronics shorted out. The captain ordered us to turn around, tried to get us out of there, but by the time we'd come about, they'd already started in on the bolts. Dr. Halen, could you explain, please? XO. It started to fall apart from the inside. Screws, bolts, nails in the damn furniture. It all started getting knocked out or unscrewed. Even some of the stuff welded in place. The voices got bad, too. And the bastards were always so matter-of-fact and calm, even while they were rattling the ship all to hell and taking everything apart. One of them was talking about all the great things he could show me. Another was gibberish I couldn't make out, but she was pissed. We could all hear the voices. There were just no bodies to go with them. It got hard to tell which voices were our crew and which were the damn... whatever they were. Dr. Halen, when was the last time you saw Captain... XO. He gave the order to turn around and told me to handle things on the bridge while he checked something below deck. I didn't know he was missing until after I gave the order to abandon ship and everyone was in the rafts but him. God, if that had only been the end of it. We started rowing away from the wreck and we heard him yelling for help. It was far off, toward the shipwreck. He and I served together for years. We helped bring in SCP. I know it was him. I figured he'd gotten knocked overboard or something. And I gave the order for a raft to go get him. Watch them get close to the horizon. Must have been two or three kilometers from the shipwreck when they just went under. No sound to it, like a kid's bobber getting pulled under by a fish on the line. I've seen men die, but I know I sent those guys someplace a lot worse. Wasn't long after that, Daniel started whispering to me about what a bastard I was, how I sent them all to die for nothing. He said the only way to make it right was to jump out of the raft and join him. Maybe I would have too, if not for the other guys on my raft. We spent hours rowing, with our friends screaming for help behind us. Even when they were far behind us, they didn't stop whispering in our ears. My friend told me it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. He never was religious, but he said that he'd found God. He said he only wanted me to see what God had shown him. We don't leave our people behind. We just... we don't. End log. Closing statement. Professor and Associates present on a research vessel are confirmed to have been acquired by SCP-473. Recommend extreme measures to be taken to prevent personnel and civilians from expiring in close proximity to SCP-473. Currently advise maintaining containment at present location due to the inherent danger of recovery and the threat of exponential strengthening through acquisition of Class D subjects at any given site. Note. Interview subject Jay's corpse was found in his quarters on April 24th, 2000. Suicide is suspected. A note nearby read, I shouldn't have left them. Testing of SCP-473 as a possible cognito hazard is recommended. Addendum 2. Continuing research has found that one professor led the doomed university expedition to the site of SCP-473. Though his research notes appear to have been lost with him, his last outgoing email includes some context of his expedition. Sent. 115, 2000. Samantha, you're right. The research papers are wordy, and I could never put my opinion in them anyway. You already know that he led a small army south to Ecuador, and eventually killed the high priest in charge of appeasing Supai. But it seems that he also captured his two daughters, and arranged to have them sent back to Spain as examples of the indigenous population. Sick bastard wanted them as trophies, or worse. Anyway, the ship's manifest listed a number of cultural artifacts in the girl's personal belongings. On that list was an item that I think represented the god himself, and that is the real prize. The manifest lists all manner of gold and artifacts that the university would love to have, even if we don't hit the jackpot on this one. Still, I can't help but get excited about the prospect of bringing back the Inca's unholy grail. All the best. P.S. Let's keep this quiet. It'd be a disaster if someone beat us there. Item number. SCP-479. Object Class. Euclid. 
Special Containment Procedures A Site-14 Standard 2mm CR4 Double Skin Steel Plate Security Door UNI-9569 Class 3 with full gasket seal is installed on either end of Hallway 4. Both doors are to be kept locked and keys retained by the ETHB on duty. D-Class personnel authorized to enter for the purposes of surveying and research. Hallway 4 is no longer authorized as a thoroughfare between the D-Class laundry and plant room. Sweeps of Site 14 looking for similar phenomena will continue to supplement regular security sweeps until further notice. Description Hallway 4 is a 25 meter long hallway connecting the plant room in the Site 14 D-Class dormitories to the laundry room. As of 2000, persons entering Hallway 4 have mentioned powerful visual, auditory, and olfactory hallucinations of blood, ranging from isolated blood spots on the floor to, quote, blood raining upwards, hitting the floor from the other side like it's the pane of a window, end quote. These visions of blood have been proven to be hallucinations. The floor at the time of the first report was plain bare concrete, and no evidence of blood can be found by chemical or photographic means. Some ordinary rust was found, but not in the quantities or locations reported in the hallucinations. The ground under Hallway 4 is the same volcanic bedrock that the rest of Site 14 rests on, proven so after a D-Class team excavated it with hand tools and a new reinforced concrete floor was poured. A thorough investigation of the walls and ceiling also turned up negative results. No abnormal chemicals are present. Neurological analysis of D-Class subjects with no prior history is pending, but so far looks inconclusive. Antipsychotic medication is ineffective. The existence of this phenomenon in a secure facility may constitute a security breach, and a report to O5 level is in preparation. A request is pending to authorize the funding to declare Hallway 4 a containment site, although at present, there is no plan in place to deal with the effect, should it spread. Item Number SCP-484 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures All samples of SCP-484 reserved for testing must be secured in Pharmaceutical Locker AG- this testing pool should include at least 20 doses of any particular form of SCP-484, or 50% if fewer samples exist. All other samples are currently stored in Secure Storage Room 112-4. All personnel of Clearance Level 3 and below must have written authorization from a Level 4 staff member to access SCP-484. Any staff member currently researching SCP-484 may not interact with any O5 personnel until the conclusion of their research and a thorough toxicology screening in search of their office space and home. If any staff member, of any security level, is found to have appropriated SCP-484 without authorization or outside experimental parameters, they are to be reprimanded and reassigned, with the stolen SCP-484 returned to containment. Description SCP-484 is a pharmaceutical of unknown origin originally discovered in use as a street drug in urban areas throughout the world. Interrogations of dealers has put a tentative first release around June 2000 in Norway. As with most street drugs, the physical form of SCP-484 varies greatly from sample to sample. SCP-484 is generally found in pill form, though at least two types have been powders within a rapidly dissolving gel pack. Reports of a transdermal patch were received, but no sample has been obtained to date. SCP-484 has a number of street names, with the most common being V, Vic, Vicar, and Care, each revolving around the word vicarious. Phrasal slang includes any mention of memories or remembering, and name code uses V names like Victor or Vivian. Unlike most street drugs, all samples of SCP-484 are nearly chemically identical. Most illegal drugs vary by manufacturer and contain impurities and additives. But other than cosmetic appearance, SCP-484 samples are identical. The only explanation for this is that all samples come from the same source. Why there is such a cosmetic variation is unknown. 
The researchers believe it is to disguise SCP-484 as a simple street drug. This also explains how a pharmaceutical with the level of sophistication demonstrated by SCP-484 reached the open market without precursors or public notice in its development. All known organizations capable of manufacturing SCP-484 are being investigated in order to determine the source. The logo seen on many iterations of SCP-484 is a tilted square with eight dots within, though no companies with similar logos are anywhere near capable of producing such a chemical. The dealer questioned in Interrogation Report 484A33 seemed genuinely unaware of the drug's origin, despite repeated and vigorous methods of interrogation. When ingested, SCP-484 is absorbed and causes the brain to produce a chemical compound previously unknown. Researchers have named the compound The compound is extremely volatile and breaks down almost immediately if extracted from the brain. Subjects experience rapidly increasing brain activity and pupil dilation. When a subject exposed to SCP-484 makes eye contact with an unaffected person, a form of telepathic connection will be established between the two subjects. The subject having ingested SCP-484 will begin to experience hallucinations of the other subject's memories. The degree of vividness and duration of these hallucinations increases with the amount of SCP-484 taken. The unexposed subjects enter semi-hypnotic state. Repeated use of SCP-484 builds a familiarity with the hallucinations, and certain subjects have been able to move through a subject's memory at will, similar to a lucid dreamer altering a dream. At higher dosages, the victims begin to lose the memories test subjects described viewing, forgetting all or part of the memory. This memory loss was accompanied by intense migraines and psychological trauma, chiefly feelings of loss and violation, though the subjects were unable to describe what exactly was lost. It was later revealed that a subject using SCP-484 at high dosages actually appropriates the memories and adds them into his or her own memories. There seems to be no limit to the number of memories a subject can absorb and existing memories are not overwritten. This data is corroborated by Interrogation Report 484-A33, though all answers from this report must still remain suspect. Testing allowed several subjects to have their memories, from childhood to the present, completely erased and absorbed by other test subjects. Those absorbing the memories reported initial discomfort and confusion by the double memories, but all those absorbed seem as real and personal as the subject's original memories. These memories seem to be maintained as long as the subject's memory is not damaged by some other chemical or trauma. The risk SCP-484 poses to information security is high, and as such, its tight regulation is vital. Research is ongoing into using SCP-484 in multiple fields. If properly controlled, it could be used to extract unwanted memories of security breaches or traumatic experiences. Permission is currently pending for use of SCP-484 with various memetic hazards. Priority is given to experiments concerning SCP-484's use in advanced espionage and information security. Addendum Excerpt from Interrogation Report 484-A33 Interrogator Dr. Assisted by Agent Subject Crimson Andrew Detained Drug Dealer Doctor So you still maintain that you were never involved in the manufacture of this drug? Crimson Andrew Coughing Done told you that already Doctor Indeed you have Yet I remain unconvinced Do you think another session with Agent would change my mind? Crimson Andrew, spitting, Fuck you. Do whatever you want. Won't change anything. Just kill me already and get it over with. Doctor, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Now, please describe what it is like to use SCP-484. Crimson Andrew, when you drop Vic, man, it's like nothing else. I've tripped on anything I can get in my arm up my nose or down my gut, and nothing was ever like Vic. Doctor, the hallucinations were more vivid. 
Crimson Andrew. Sorta. It's not like that, though. When you're on a trip, you know it. You know, at least somewhere, that the walls ain't really melting, you know? But on Vic, no matter how weird it gets, you know it's real. Everything you see, it's like you're doing it. And afterwards, it's like you've done it from the beginning. Doesn't bother me that I have to take it away from someone. It lets me have a better life. Better history. Doctor. Better. Elaborate. Crimson Andrew. Well, check this. You remember being a kid. How happy simple could make you. New toy, climbing a new tree, just playing whatever. Well, Vic lets you experience that again and again. And every time it's different, but it stays with you. Doctor, how do you mean? Crimson Andrew, you remember your fifth birthday? Doctor, I don't see how that's relevant. Crimson Andrew, just f do you remember or not? Doctor, yes, I do. Crimson Andrew, how was it? Doctor, I really don't. Crimson Andrew, shouting, How the f was it? Doctor, it was very nice. Crimson Andrew, yeah, usually are. You know how many fifth birthdays I've had? 38. I remember one where my dad, or some bitch's dad, really, but he's my dad when I remember it. N not like looks like my dad, he's a big fat f but it's still like he's mine, you know? Anyway. My dad got me a fucking pony. Who really does that? It's a joke or something from TV. No one really does that. But my dad did. That's the purest joy I've ever felt. No jealousy, no fear, nothing tainting it, and no hangover afterward. Just pure, simple joy. Doctor, how poetic. Crimson Andrew. Yeah, it is. Especially since my real dad never gave me nothing but a good ass whoop when the beer ran out at night. With the Vic, I got a thousand happy memories that make the bad ones less important. Gonna come in handy soon, I bet. Doctor, how's that exactly? Crimson Andrew, well, when you people kill me, it sure as hell ain't gonna be my shitty life flashing before my eyes. Item number, SCP-496. Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures MTF Gamma 6 Deep Feeders are to assist MTF Beta 7 Maz Hatters in monitoring and researching SCP 496. The current perimeter around SCP 496 is to be publicly designated as a protected marine wildlife reserve. All personnel located inside of the perimeter must wear waterproof protective gear that covers their entire person, and avoid any skin contact with water. Personnel studying SCP-496 are to focus their research on finding a way of slowing or halting the spread of SCP-496. Description: SCP-496 is a substance composed primarily of calcium carbonate that covers a 35 square kilometer area of the sea floor. 84 kilometers off the coast of Jakarta, Indonesia. The substance has characteristics of a waterborne contagion that is capable of infecting an organism via contact with the skin. Once SCP-496 has infected an organic substance, it will begin the process of converting all organic matter of the subject into SCP-496. Signs and symptoms of an SCP-496 infection include batches of red or skin-colored welts, Note: Subjects with a tendency to perspirate heavily will show increased amounts of welts. Severe itching. Note: Water has been shown to reduce the severity on the infected areas it is applied to. However, exposure to moisture of any kind will accelerate the infection. Painful swelling of the lips, eyelids, and inside the throat. Note: Internal bleeding may occur depending on how hydrated the subject is. Once the SCP-496 infection reaches the brain, the victim may suffer from Delusions Disorganized thinking 
extremely disorganized or abnormal motor behavior. Hallucinations Note, testimony of the hallucinations experienced by Agent Viva can be found in Addendum 496-1. Once the SCP-496 infection has spread throughout the entire body, the following symptoms will occur. Conversion of all organic matter into SCP-496. Normally, the process takes 17 hours. However, if the subject is submerged into water, the transformation will occur within 56 minutes. Note, most subjects exposed to SCP-496 have expired before reaching this stage of infection. Addendum 496-1 SCP-496 was discovered by a Foundation research vessel while investigating reports of an abandoned fishing liner, drifting in the middle of the ocean. Inspection of the fish hold of the ship revealed a large mass of SCP-496, which formed due to infected fish being stored in close proximity. The ship was boarded by a local Foundation research vessel. Attempts to locate the missing crew failed, however. An individual infected by SCP-496 was found inside of a locked room in the cargo hold of the ship. The state of the room showed signs of an aggressive struggle. Addendum 496-2 Due to a lack of understanding of the contagious properties of SCP-496, Agent Viva became exposed to SCP-496 while inspecting the infected individual. The moment Foundation personnel became aware of the contagion, the subject was quarantined in a standard containment cell located on the research vessel. Agent Viva agreed to cooperate while under quarantine, and a portion of the video log from their observation has been added to this file. Video Log Agent Viva is locked inside of a containment room, located in the storage hold of the ship. A camera has been placed in the room so Dr. Wilson may observe the infection as it advances. At the time of this segment, Approximately 50% of the subject's body has been converted into SCP-496. Begin Log Dr. Wilson Agent, are you still able to communicate? Agent Viva Yes. It's hard, though. The subject begins looking around the room, causing flakes of SCP-496 to fall off of their neck. Agent Viva I... I'm seeing things. This isn't real. Dr. Wilson, Agent, what are you seeing? The subject is silent for 12 seconds. Dr. Wilson, Agent Viv... Agent Viva, uh, a city made of stone. It's... it's underwater. It's full of people, but they aren't drowning. They look... happy. There's a temple decorated in... so many different shades of coral. Dr. Wilson, can you see the room you are in? Agent Viva Yes, but I can see the people too. The people going into the temple. And praying. They look beautiful with the coral adorned on their face. The subject walks to the door of her cell and attempts to escape. Agent Viva We should go back. It's better down there. Please let me out. Dr. Wilson Agent Viva, please try and focus on what you are seeing. Step away from the... Agent Viva, the water made us, and it wants us back. The subject begins pounding on the door while pleading to be released. Vocalization ended once Agent Viva's esophagus fully closed due to swelling. Agent Viva then expired due to suffocation. End log. Note, after the report of a contagion was received, MTF Beta-7, Maz Hatters, and MTF Gamma-6, Deep Feeders, were dispatched to begin investigating the seabed for signs of SCP-496. Controlled testing of SCP-496 on D-Class personnel is authorized in order to study its effects. Addendum 496-3 Further investigations of the seabed have revealed structures that resemble those described by Agent Viva buried underneath a three-meter-thick layer of SCP-496. Carbon dating has confirmed the structures to be over 3,000 years old. As of the writing of this document, 1,312 humanoids infected by SCP-496 have been discovered inside of these structures. The current perimeter of SCP-496, as of the writing of this addendum, 
spans a 35 kilometer area and is growing at a rate of 4.7 meters a year. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.